nine of college football is in the books, and it is your new favorite college football podcast with yet another episode. The point after episode 22, week nine reactions and recap. Cody, what a weekend it was. It wasn't the best weekend. It wasn't the worst weekend, but we got a lot of little quick hits and stuff to talk about during this episode here. But Cody, as always, it's Monday. We got to react. We got to recap. How are you doing on this fine Monday? Man, uh, a lot of upsets, a couple field stormings uh, over the weekend. Um, I got destroyed in the picks, so uh, <laughs> Jackson Groff is now back in the game. Down um, 11. Now we're up big, baby. But you went bold, though. You went bold last week, which I can't complain. You got to go with your heart. But, hey, it happens, Cody. We keep we keep going. We keep pressing forward. Yeah, those damn rivalry games. <laughs> <laughs> and got me. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Sorry, no. Just excited. Just a, another great weekend of college football. Excited to break it down, man. We are almost done with October, which means the games they remember are playing in in November. We've got the CFP rankings coming out on Tuesday, um, Tuesday night, and we're gonna come out with a reaction video and have that up on Wednesday morning. So be tuned, be tuned to watch that. We usually start out with the AP poll, but we're no longer focused on the AP poll anymore, Cody. We're now focused on the CFP polls from here on out. But today we're going to break down one game today. Then we're gonna go through the good, the bad, the ugly, some quick hits of college football's week nine. But the game of the week, let's start out, Cody. Oregon at Utah, 8 Oregon wins 35-6 to six at 13 Utah. College game day was there. What a barn burner. A lot to break down, a lot to look at here, Cody. But what was your biggest takeaway, your biggest standout when you saw Oregon's dominance against Utah yesterday? To me, Oregon and Bo Nix looked so sharp. It was almost like they were completely unbothered by the fact that they were at altitude, on the road, a big home winning streak against arguably one of the better defenses in the country. Bo Nix looked comfortable. Another virtuoso performance on the road against a tough conference, a tough ranked conference opponent. Man, uh, Bucky Irving was able to get his feet in the paint a few times. Um Everything that we said that Oregon looked good doing against Washington, they looked just as good, if not better, um, on the offensive side. And then on the defensive side, I mean, six points um, to a team like Utah, who just put up 34 against USC uh, the week before. Wow. A virtuoso performance by Oregon. Probably their best performance of the year so far. It's insane, too, how in college football, and I'm going to kind of relate this to us. You know, obviously we had parents and stuff, and usually when when parents have kids – and they raise them, usually those kids have certain characteristics or certain habits of their parents. That's how they like, kind of were born and raised of. Like, for example, I say certain things with my dad, or sometimes people are like, oh, Cody, like you, what you said there reminds me of your mom and stuff. It's kind of like what Dan Lanning is in terms of Kirby Smart and what he learned there and turned this Oregon team. Like this Oregon team is kind of looking like that Georgia when they've got grit or when their back's against the wall, they, they don't turn down. They've got complete competitive stamina was, was my biggest takeaway, and there was no lack of letdown. Whether it was, a, it was a field goal late, they were back at it. You saw, I mean, Cody, this team looks like, I don't want to say the Georgia teams or like the old Bama teams of the 2010s, but the there's no room for error on this team. The complacency they have is unreal. But it's crazy to think how, like, you know, Lincoln Riley, when he was around Mike Leach, has certain tendencies of him. Now you're starting to see Dan Lanning with what he learned from Kirby Smart paying the tuition here in year two at Oregon. Yeah, you know, I think you called it. I mean, they're able to run the football. Their quarterback is efficient. <laughs> Stetson Bennett, love you. Arguably the GOAT. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's neither here nor there. But, no, their quarterback is hyper-efficient. He doesn't turn the ball over. He's a senior. They run the football effectively. They have a suffocating defense. I mean, it sounds similar to what Georgia has put on the field the last two years. Um, hmm. And right now, personally, if you put Oregon and Georgia on the field right now, who wins? I don't That's know. That's one of the biggest things, too, with Oregon is they're never too focused on the other opponent. They're never, you know, late penalties, unsportsmanlike. They're super disciplined. I think they only had two penalties last game, and their only focus is on themselves. And what I love most, this was probably the biggest standout where I said, okay, Bo Nix, this, this is a guy that could, that could take this team to a CFP. They're up 35 to six, and he's screaming at his running back because he ran the wrong route on a check down. And they're up 35 to six. 35 to six, and he's so, he's so like, wants everything to be so perfect. 
and up to the standards of this Oregon team because he knows down the road when they play some of those teams, so some of those harder teams like you know Washington again, or if they got to play, uh, they got to play USC still, so they got to play USC. Which say what you want Next about week, USC, it's Caleb Williams. Any day Caleb Williams is on the field, you got to ball out, you got to prepare, and you got to you know capitalize on situations. But what Bo Nix did yesterday, what kind of stood out to you from Bo Nix standpoint? Uh, in this game, in, in a hostile environment, Utah, they don't lose at home. But yesterday, or on Saturday, they did. Yeah, you know, I think the biggest thing for me is just his leadership under pressure in a hostile environment. We've seen it now at UW and now at Oregon. Arguably the two toughest places to play in the Pac-12, minus or obviously Autzen Stadium. That's his own home stadium. Um, mm. But yeah, that was like what we what we're seeing with Bo Nix right now is – a senior quarterback who's seen a lot of tough environments, who now is motivated by the fact that they lost a close game that they probably should have and could have won at Washington. And like you're literally seeing, similar to what you just said, the last few years, Alabama will lose a game during the regular season and then they just boat race people to the national championship. I'd argue mm. that right now, Oregon looks better than Washington. No disrespect to Washington. I, I'd you're, agree. I'd it, agree. You're a, you're a good football team, but what Oregon is doing against quality opponents since they lost to you, I like. if I'm Washington, I'd be very nervous right now. Very, I, I agree with that, too. And the biggest thing that stood out to me, what they did so well is the passing game. And that was something that looking into the season when we previewed Oregon was who was going to be that number one wide receiver for him, who was going to step up and be that guy. Troy Franklin is that guy. He's that reliable wide receiver one. I, I'm I'm done with you know thinking this guy can maybe be a two or maybe he can't really take over the game. He took over against that Utah secondary when their front was so they, their front seven is one of the best in college football, and they ran the football effectively, which is a plus. But they can pass the football with the way they did almost 250 yards passing, two touchdowns that definitely opened up the running game. And the biggest takeaway too. That offensive line might be up for offensive line of the year. Zero sacks against a really good defensive line, Cody. That's big time. Oregon's all line, kind of, again, like how Georgia's offensive line's always been. It's crazy how Kirby Smart and what what Dan Lanning learned there and what he learned from Nick Saban when he was a GA is starting to come into fruition when he's there in year two at Oregon. Yeah, definitely. You know, when you can build from the trenches and allow those skill positions to kind of build around them, you're going to have success. I mean, you look at like Georgia, their front, like you said, their front seven, the last couple of years has been all time great. Um, and mm -hmm. now you start to see the same trend over at Oregon. Dan Lanning doing a really good job recruiting on the defensive line. Shout out to young um, uh, Teo Uyunglele. Mm. Isn't that DJ's little brother? Yeah. Um, so it's good to see him. Like he's getting in the rotation. He's playing five star. And so they're, like you said, building from the trenches up. And now Oregon is reaping the benefits from it. All right, Cody, let's transition to the Utah side of things and what happened wrong for them. Uh, 35 to 6. We, we said in the preview episode that their offense had to score 30 points to be in this game, and that wasn't the case. Field goals aren't going to win when you play a quality opponent like Oregon. That was my biggest standout there for them. Um, when, when you have a good drive, you got to execute with touchdowns. And part of that plays to the execution of it. Part of that plays to how aggressive you were, and they were on that one fourth and one. They didn't get it, unfortunately, with Kyle Whittingham there. But um, that was my biggest takeaway with them is their lack of execution there. And it was one of those games like how Washington beat Oregon. They scored thirty points or more. You can't you can't you can't beat Oregon if you're not scoring thirty points and rely on your defense that much. Their defense was on the field for so long there, Cody. I just thought Utah's defense got tired. Um, and then my second one, the running game was non-existent. I mean, you you got ninety nine yards rushing, thirty seven yards with Jackson. Vaki didn't get anything on the running game as well. They didn't really use him in the wide receiver room too, which was kind of surprising what happened last right. week. But I'm going to take it to you. What stood out to hear from Utah and their loss? And then after that, give us a little breakdown on Bryson Barnes. Yeah, you know, I think ultimately, I think Oregon did a really, really good job not only switching up how they had their coverages in, in the secondary, but also the twists, the stunts. We went 3-3 three, three stack, they went 3-4, they went 4-3, they went 4-2-5. They were mixing up all their fronts and their coverages, which slowed Bryson Barnes down, and he wasn't able to play fast and be aggressive, pushing the ball down the field to his wide receivers. Also, with Oregon's secondary being so athletic, long, and aggressive, they were able to disrupt uh, Utah's wide receivers. Utah doesn't really have a big-time number one guy. No disrespect to Money Parks, you're just small. Like He's more of a slot, kind of a quick 
guy. So anytime big physical DBs are able to get their hands on you and disrupt your timing and your routes, we said Bryson Barnes needed to play perfect. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to do that. Um, Oregon is kind of that like boa constrictor, right? If they're able to stop you on first and second down running the football, they're starting to condense you down. Now I need to throw it on third and long. Now they're able to throw intricate pressures and coverages at an inexperienced quarterback. And it almost was the mirror image of why Utah lost on the road at Oregon State. Oregon State did the exact same thing to Bryson Barnes and Nate Johnson in that game, and it showed. And I think Oregon probably took that blueprint and had better athletes, more speed, and a better offense to really stretch that lead late in that football game against Utah. And when you look at it, too, Utah no sacks on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, some of those could have been sacks, but again, Bo Nix's quick ability to make quick decisions and kind of take the pressure sh- straight on, make some accurate throws there was the biggest takeaway for me in his game. You want to talk about a guy that was absolutely awful at Auburn, goes to Oregon, says, hey, I'm going to stay warmer year instead of, you know, with that NIL money, $2 million. Now it's paying off for him. Now he could be a first-round, second-round pick when you look at, you know, the Vikings or the Packers, those later picks for the NFL draft there. But they're executing on all levels, pivotal turnovers. And one thing I love about Oregon is they always capitalize on their turnovers with points. That's what makes great teams. That's what separates great teams from good teams is be able to capitalize um, and and award your defense for playing so well with the fumbles or with the the interception they had too. That was the biggest takeaway for me. And also, their tight end Ferguson is starting to emerge too. So now you got Ferguson in the middle. You got Troy Franklin, Gary Bryant on the out, Bryant on the outside. And then you've got Jordan, their backup running back, Jordan James, and then you got Bucky Irving. A lot more weapons than I thought there was here at Oregon, Cody. Yeah, you know, some guys have really stepped up. We talked about at the beginning of the year who's going to step up. We knew Troy Franklin was kind of like projected to be that guy, but it really has been cool to watch him kind of step up and really start to take the top off of defenses. I know he had a big game against Washington, um, had a really good game uh, this game as well against Utah. Uh, So anytime you're able to do that against two quality opponents, especially defenses like that, it really shows your mettle. So it's good to see Oregon having those playmakers of old, kind of like when you start to think about like De'Anthony Thomas, uh, Kenyon Barner, or LaMichael James, and guys like mm-hmm. that, uh, Jordan Addison, uh, Bray- or Braylon Addison, sorry, um, and all those guys, Keenan Lowe, and guys like that, that in the past that used to play for Oregon. Um, it's kind of good to see Oregon's skill position kind of getting back to those levels. For Utah fans, keep your head high. Still a lot of season ahead of you. You'll make a bowl game, and hey, you got Cam Rising next year. I would say they win the Big 12 next year. Is my my favorite for Utah next year? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, think, Cam I think they win the. Yeah, Cam Rising definitely. Yeah, Cam, Cam Rising comes back full full tilt, full hundred percent, full year off of being able to get healthy. I think he's going to come back with a vengeance. Utah is going to be my runaway pick next year. Spoiler alert for the Big Twelve. Yeah, and you've got Isaac Wilson to back him up too, which we're excited to see him when he's at Utah too. But for Utah's schedule, they got home against ASU, they got at Washington, home or sorry, at Arizona, then home against Colorado. So they can get a couple wins in there. That game at Washington, Washington, you got to pick it up because hey, Utah plays good on the road. That's gonna be an interesting game to see if Washington can get over the hump there. And then for Oregon, what's 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 next for Oregon here, Cody? They got Cal at home. They got USC at home, they got at ASU, and they got the Oregon State game on the road, or sorry, at home for the last game of the season. What does Oregon need to continue to do to make that Pac-12 championship? What, what do they need to continue to do? And is there any worry that you have on their schedule um, that maybe, you know, Oregon fans should, you know, hold their breath for um, coming down the stretch? I think the only game that they need to be pushing towards, like all roads are pointing to that Oregon State game. I know it kind of lost a little bit of its luster with Oregon State losing on the road to Arizona. We'll get into that later. But Oregon State is well equipped to give Oregon all the fits that they want. They're able to run the football. They play good defense. They have an aggressive secondary to kind of disrupt Troy Franklin. They have a really good scheme with DJU and being able to run the ball with Mr. Martinez out of the backfield. Um, Mm -hmm. Just Not to mention a new X factor that's been emerging all season. Friend of the program, Aiden Childs, Agent Mm -hmm. Zero back there, slinging the ball as well. Had a couple big plays against Arizona. Um, I think he would have thrown a touchdown pass if he gets the ball out sooner um, in one of his touch on one of his deep balls. Um, Mm -hmm. But other than that, man, yeah, I'd say all roads point to that Oregon State game. I think Oregon is doing exactly what they're supposed to do. I think they're going to win out. Um, up until that Civil War game. And obviously with rivalry games, you never really know. We'll see kind of what Oregon State looks like once we get there. But um, in the meantime, Bo Nix, Bucky Irving and crew, Troy Franklin, keep doing what you're doing. 
Let's get into the good, the bad, the ugly, the week nine takeaways. And we're going to go through a lot, folks. We're going to go through the quick hits of everything that went on this weekend that we love, that we were like, man, on, maybe it could get better. And then the ugly that we absolutely did not like. I'm going to start us off here with the good. And this quarterback, you know, was put in a situation where it was very tough for him with, with the national championships and with, with all the hype of Stetson Bennett. This guy is dealing. This guy is nice. Carson Beck deserves more attention. I even think maybe to be a Heisman finalist, what he's doing there with all the pressure to go into a hostile environment, rivalry game against Florida, Florida scores first without your best target in Brock Bowers, he stepped up big. We said Lad McConkey had to step up. Welcome back to the party, Lad McConkey. We said we said uh, Dewan Edwards, help, help your quarterback out with the running game. He helped out two touchdowns, 96 yards. For Mr. Edwards, but Cody, you could kind of elaborate on on Carson Beck, but I think he looks patient. I think he's starting to work through his project, project progression, excuse me, and he's really developing. And I think that's what a guy, an example of a guy that could have transferred, you know, one year or even after his redshirt year, and could have went somewhere else and probably started and maybe tried to develop this somewhere else. But he believed in the program, believed what Kirby Smart was preaching, and loved Georgia. I love those guys that stay in the program and that are competing every day against the best. You know, he's going against scout team against some of the best defensive players that are in the NFL right now. So that also prepares you for what he's doing right now. But this is a guy that looks comfortable in in critical situations on fourth down, third down, red zone. Um, When his team needed most, I thought he prevailed. This is a guy that needs more attention, Cody. And when it's all said and done, if you need a Heisman guy, Heisman finalist, I I would not argue he'd be a Heisman finalist. Now I don't think he would really win. He's going to win the Heisman. But if, if you look at you know Penix, you look at uh, JJ McCarthy, you know the Jaden Daniels, Carson Beck could be in there. He'd be that fourth or fifth guy that gets an invite. But your thoughts on what I just said there, and then your thoughts about Carson Beck in this Georgia offense? Yeah, no, he's not getting an invite to New York. But okay, 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 <laughs> okay, okay. We can disagree. We can no, we can agree to disagree. Carson Beck. I love you. I love what you've been able to do this year. I wasn't a believer at the beginning of the year. I genuinely wasn't sure if you were going to be able to do it. Now, was was I guilty of Stetson Bennett love? A hundred percent. But at the same time, you've stepped up in moments that your team has needed you. Like Jackson, you already alluded to. He stepped up in big moments. He's made big throws. He didn't have his top target. I think it was almost perfect timing for Lad McConkey to get back when Brock, like back to 100% as Brock Bowers is leaving. Um, mm-hmm. But like you said, uh, Carson Beck has been able to step up and deliver. I think they've done a really, really good job um, leaving running backs into chip, leaving tight ends into chip, just to make mm-hmm. sure that he has a little bit more time in that pocket to feel comfortable and really dice these defenses up. The receivers are doing a good job winning on the outside, and Carson Beck is delivering, man. He's standing and firing, man. It's good to see. Um, shout out to Carson Beck of Georgia. Yeah, this Georgia team's looking back to what we thought they were going to be. They're the number one team in the country for a reason. And when, when it's all said and done, we'll talk about the CFP later. They got to be the number one team. Yes, their schedule is not as str- strong as some other ones, not as strong as the resumes. But the respect factor, the two, two-time two national champ back-to-back, you got to put Georgia on top. Um, and they made Florida look stupid. Now Billy Napier is on the chopping block once again. Graham Mertz, oh, man, I mean, I, I don't know what we saw from him. He, he started out strong. Um, they struggled down the stretch, and that's all credit to that Georgia defense. But the Georgia offensive line, the defensive line, continuing to step up there. Um, any last thoughts you got from Georgia, Florida? And then we'll move on to your first good. Uh, no, sir. The uh, what do they call it? The Death Star continues to march on. Georgia, <laughs> the keeps bad it rolling. guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Your first good from Week Nine. My first good from Week Nine. I gotta say it. Kansas, you guys looked really, really good at home. I know there was a couple mistakes by Jason Bean, threw a pick late in that game. That was tough, but you guys kept fighting. Shout out to the Kansas crowd. You guys were awesome. Uh, Made it tough on Oklahoma. Shout out to the Kansas defense. Guys, Kansas DBs are so underrated. It is unreal. Mm -hmm. Kobe Bryant, I think you're probably going to be – Excuse me. Witherspoon, the guy, the first round draft pick from the Seahawks. I think Kobe Bryant could be the next Mr. Witherspoon. Don't shoot the messenger. No, no none that- of you guys, none of you guys knew who Mr. Witherspoon was last year. The Seahawks drafted him in the, with the fourth pick or whatever, and he's been balling ever since. So I don't want to mm-hmm. hear nothing. None of you guys knew who he was. 
I mean, some of you really people who are tapped in probably did, but other than you guys, you guys didn't know who he was. I had my doubts. He's been showing up and showing out. I think Kobe Bryant could be the next guy in line to take that mantle this year um, in the draft. Should he come out? Um, Jason Bean, you stepped up when your team needed you big fourth down conversion on that game winning drive. Um, and that Kansas defense stood tall. <clears throat> Shout out to the fans in Lawrence, Kansas Jayhawks, big, biggest win in school history. I think. That's a good point you said about Kobe Bryant because Witherspoon was one of those guys that really stepped out once the combine happened and once senior bowl happened in the pro day and stuff like that. This is a guy in Kobe Bryant, like you mentioned, and Kobe Bryant, another guy, another corner that actually plays for the Seahawks. Doesn't play much because you got Woolen and you've got Witherspoon out, but he's added depth. He's a good guy there out of Cincinnati. But I'm going to throw it back to you. Uh, Kansas, real quick, I, I thought Bean's been playing well. He's fast, man. I know two interceptions, but I think the biggest thing, you look at the stats-wise, you think, okay, this guy played an average game. I thought he made 15 throws. I think five of those were in crucial moments, third down, fourth down, that last drive of the game where we even texted. We said, you know, Oklahoma, too much time on the clock um, that they gave up at the end. Their defense stepped up. But even for, you know, Kansas to uh, – when he, when he had the – it was either the interception or the fumble late where Oklahoma got the ball and then Oklahoma couldn't get a first down. Kansas yep. comes back, dials it up, bounces back, drives down the field. I was really impressed with this Kansas team like you mentioned, and we'll talk about the Big 12 later because that whole chaos is for another segment. But I'm going to throw it back to you. What happened for Oklahoma? Why did this – loss occur for the Sooners and yeah what happened we'll talk about the now before we talk about what's next sure so for Oklahoma it boiled down to one thing when their defense had to get a stop had to get a stop they couldn't do it Mm. they went man coverage on third and nine or on fourth and nine when I think a zone would have been just fine um, they ended up getting turned around on a deep, deep dig route. And the guy ended up breaking for like 40, 30 yards, which put the ball inside the 10 for the game winning touchdown. I think mm. on that play, if you go zone, maybe bring a zone pressure force Jason Bean to a side, um, all eyes would be on the quarterback and zone pressure. So that would negate him being able to run for a first down. That's just what I would have done. But Brent Venables is the man for a reason. You ride with the guy who brought you there. You just hate mm-hmm. to see them lose with their defense on the field like that to me. But mm-hmm. ultimately, like I said, hats off to Kansas more than down on Oklahoma. Great win, great team win, great atmosphere there in Lawrence. 11 penalties for 101 yards is not going to win you ball games either. That's pretty undisciplined from Oklahoma, something that we're not used to seeing. But I know the biggest thing, too, they both had three turnovers, but Oklahoma's turnovers were way more pivotal that set up points for Kansas. I mean, the one on the kickoff return right after Kansas just scored or, you know, the fumble in the red zone, I believe it was by the running back or by Dylan Gabriel in the red zone that really bit a really good drive that they couldn't get any points on to give Kansas the ball back were the two things for me. But any concern from you, Dylan Gabriel threw a pick six. I know it was early in the game. I know I saw that Dylan pick, saw that pick six there, and I said, whoa, 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 Dylan. This looks like old Dylan Gabriel. Any concern moving forward and what does Oklahoma need to do in now a very tight must-win situation every single week to even squeeze in the Big 12 championship? Because right now, Kansas has got a game on them, and they're both tied with one loss. Five, six teams all tied. Yeah, I would say uh, Oklahoma, just keep doing what you're doing on the offensive side of the ball. I think Dylan Gabriel bounced back really, really well from that pick six that he threw. Um, obviously, leading his team back, taking the lead. Um, opportunity to win at the end of the game. Um, but I'll just say this. You can't. Um, Jimmy Dykes says it the best in college basketball. You can't throw pick sixes. Like if you want to win games, you can't throw pick sixes. When he's What he's referring to in college basketball is when you turn the ball over live for layups. So when you give essentially mm-hmm. a defense a layup by throwing a pick six, not only does that give them confidence, it wakes the crowd up, gets the crowd into the game, erases a lot of doubt, gives everyone a lot of confidence to play against the obvious favorite in the game, which is Oklahoma. So now Kansas believes, and they're able to play with the lead, which allows them to be a little bit more aggressive. If he can avoid those turnovers moving forward, I think Oklahoma will be just fine. Stay tuned for the ep- end of the episode. We're going to talk about Big 12 scenarios and what's going on because Week 10, a very pivotal week for the Big 12. Half of those teams are going to get narrowed down. We're going to get from six 
to three teams when it's all said and done on who's going to go to the Big 12 championship. Speaking of the Big 12, my next good. Yeah. I got to give credit to Texas and Malik Murphy, and here's why. Ooh. Great football teams know how to step up and win when their best player is down. I think when other when other teammates know, okay, we got a retro freshman guy and he's probably going to be nervous. A good BYU team, a good BYU team, five and two, now five and three, with the veteran quarterback and Keen Slovis and, and their coach, which I forget his name, is very veteran as well. He knows how to dial up defenses to make a freshman quarterback uncomfortable. And I thought that great teams, when, when their big players are down, new roles, new guys step up, with everyone's role needs to step up more. And I thought Xavier Worthy was one example. Punt return touchdown, big. Maybe you're going to get a special teams touchdown. That helps your quarterback even more. Brooks on the running game. I thought their defense holding BYU, which two turnovers there. I believe he had he had, um, he had an interception. He had a fumble early in the game. Yep. Very yep. bad interception, very bad fumble, which you expect from a redshirt freshman. But what does this defense do? Holds BYU to field goals. Whenever you can hold an away team to field goals and you're at home, that's a big win especially a team like BYU that can score on the offensive side of the ball. I thought that was big. And lastly, after those after those turnovers, Murphy bounced back big. Two touchdown passes, found A.D. Mitchell, found Jatavian Sanders, who's one of the best tight ends. Obviously, Brock Bowers, but he, he's starting to get some recognition as well. But Absolutely. this is the guy in Murphy. I, I, again, the future's bright for him. We'll see what Quinn Ewers does if he comes back next year. But I think regardless of what happens, I think he transfers just because of Arch Manning and what's going on there with Texas. I think he'd be smart. This was kind of his transfer portal audition tape, if you if you will. These next couple games, I, I think he transfers out of there. But, Cody, what I was impressed with is just Texas's ability when, their court, when the quarterback was down. In, in a big game at BYU, I understand the spread was big and stuff, but have big players step up in exceeded roles when, when Murphy needed them most. I thought that was big for Texas. And they got Kansas State, which is a tough game. But I like what I'm seeing from Texas. You mentioned how Oregon's the best team in the Pac-12 over Washington. I would argue, I think, Texas. Now, obviously, you know, the game last week, Kansas lost. You could you could say that's an easy thing to say. But I think Texas looks like the best team right now in the Big 12 ever since that wake-up call against Oklahoma. Just your thoughts on Texas. Yeah, absolutely. Texas has the best roster, the biggest fan base, uh, like the depth needed. I think Texas is just fine, really, not only in the Big 12, but also for their college football playoff uh, implications. I mean, at the end of the day, like mm -hmm. I said it at the beginning of the season, Texas has the best roster in the Big 12, and they should win it. But I just don't think they will. And part of that is because they're not used to winning. And right now, when their big-time dude is down, like the fact that Quinn Ewers is out going into Kansas State, I, I, if I'm Texas, I'm terrified. No disrespect to Texas. You should win that game. You have the better roster. You have the better players across the board. But Kansas State always plays tough. They run the football. They're hard-nosed. They're physical. They're going to smack you in the mouth. How are you going to respond? And how is, more specifically, Malik Murphy going to respond to getting hit in the mouth? I strongly disagree. I think this team is ready for Kansas State. I think they're hot right now. I think with Murphy, he's even going to get even better every week. I think Kansas State should be nervous. Going, in, going into Texas like that, Yes, things are clicking, but you still got a two quarterback system, which I don't think two quarterback systems work, to be honest. I think one quarterback's either flustered by the other or it's a competition inside the game. And you know that too, Cody. But I, I know you're an Oklahoma fan, but we got to recognize what Texas is doing right now. Cody, we got to recognize what Texas is doing. Oh, they're doing it. Like I said, I don't like every year Kansas State surprises every single year. And it shouldn't be a surprise anymore. It's just and, Kansas and it's State late is, too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's late in the season. Yeah. What does Kansas State always do? Yeah, it'll be a fun matchup, and we'll get into that Week 10, obviously, next week. What's another good for it? What's another good standout that you saw from Week 9? Ooh, I think we both have the same one, so we can kind of jump into it together. But the Arizona Wildcats, man, they are looking better and better every single week. Noah Fafita has injected some energy into that team. He led the comeback win on the road at Stanford, and ever since then, this team has not looked back. They've battled Washington tough. They battled USC tough, and then they finally got over the hump at Washington State, and they have not looked back. Um, Tedaroa McMillan is balling. Jacob Cowling is balling. Justin Flo is starting to get into a flow, pun intended, um, on the defensive side of the ball. Their DBs are big and physical, very underrated on the edges out there at cornerback. They're playing really, really good football. Right now, if there's a team in the Pac-12 that I do not want to play, there's two of them, Oregon and 1B is – Arizona. 
They've got a game at home against UCLA. UCLA big win last week. UCLA is already two and a half point favorite, which is kind of you know Awful. shocking there. Seven thirty game mind. again in Tucson. Seven thirty again in, in Tucson. That's gonna be a tough environment. I would yeah. take Arizona. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little spoiler there. Spoiler they got alert. At, <laughs> yeah. You got at Colorado. They got home against Utah again. Home against Utah. A tough place to play in Arizona. I don't know. They could run the table. They got UCLA, Colorado, Utah, and Arizona State. They could win up to eight games, but definitely one more game to make a bowl game would be in the right step for Arizona. My biggest takeaway with this team, man, what would the season look like if the Vita started the season? Well, what would this team look like? I think they'd be ranked. I think they would definitely have, you know, uh, the USC game was tough. The Vita was in there, but again, inexperienced. Washington was the first game, but that Mississippi State game was definitely one that you look at and say if Fafita was in there earlier after even two interceptions because Delora threw three interceptions, you wonder how the outcome of that game is. And seeing what Mississippi State is at now, if Arizona and Mississippi State play now, I think Arizona wins by – not Arizona State, sorry, Arizona. I think they win by 20 points. Easy. Right? 15, Easy. 20 points. But I want to I want to throw it back to you. You got to talk about this Fafita McMillan connection here because this is getting me excited and Arizona fans excited about what's to come with these two. How big is it for a quarterback to not only have a reliable target like McMillan, but a guy that you've played with since high school? What's the future of this duo for years to come? Because they're only redshirt freshmen and sophomores right now, so they got a year or two left after this season. Yeah, you know, Tedero and McMillan kind of came across, like, kind of exploded on the scene on the seven on seven circuit a couple years ago. Um, uh, playing with, uh, I want to say it was Nico Amaliava. Um, and then they also, he also was playing with the OC Buckeyes with Noah Fafita as his quarterback. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously at high school, they played at Servite together. Um, and it's just been, it, anytime you have that chemistry and that connection, like I, we actually talked about it last week on our preview episode, just on how like having a guy that you can just hit up, they're probably either roommates or close to roommates. He probably shoots him a text, hey, man, let's go to the field and throw. Even when they're not mm-hmm. supposed to. Let's go to the field and throw. Hey, you want to come over and just throw? Hey, you want to come over and hang out? And the cool thing, too, and what makes them even more dangerous is you can start to see he's really starting to develop that same type of chemistry with Jacob Cowling, another top-level wide receiver. So now you have Tedaroa McMillan on one side, Jacob Cowling on the other. Sometimes they're on the same side. Not to mention that two-headed monster at running back as well. Mm. Arizona's offense is really starting to round into shape. And I think it's giving that defense confidence to know that they can be a little bit more aggressive because they know that their offense at some point is going to break out throughout every football game. I think what's scary about Noah Fafita right now at such a young age is he's such a good game manager. His, his ability to manage the game is insane. And one standout point here, uh, it was it's the fourth quarter. There's seven minutes and 42 seconds left. They start the ball around midfield. They're up three. I mean, Fafita would go down, get a touchdown to get up 10 with two minutes and 24 seconds left. So you had about five minutes of time to get off the clock when you're up three to kind of stall, maybe get your defense a little breather, get drive down the field, crucial third downs, crucial fourth downs. That was a moment for me, Cody. I looked at this Fafita guy, and I'm like, this is a guy that's a game manager. For a game manager like him to do that, um, waste the clock, take his defense off the field and, and take what the defense gave him and not only score, but to score with points that touchdown. That was basically the nail in the coffin. That was the dagger in this one for Arizona, the explosive weapons they have, the playmakers they have, the, the, the depth, especially the young depth that they have too is something to definitely look out for for Arizona. But on the other side of it, that defense, 87 yards for Martinez is big time. Those are some quick takeaways I have there, but – uh, your thoughts on Fafita being a game manager and then what you saw from this defense, too, because Martinez is, is one of the best running backs in, in college football. When he can take over a game, he'll take over. But 87 yards for a guy that averaged, I think, like 150 a game, big time. Absolutely. Um, one thing I'll say about Fafita as a game manager, at the end of the day, quarterbacks are supposed to manage football games and take the opportunities when they present themselves. I hate that moniker that some of these guys get when they're they're not putting up the Michael Penix numbers or the Caleb Williams numbers that doesn't Mm -hmm. make you a game manager that makes you a smart quarterback at the end of the day if you have a running game that's doing what it's been doing the last couple weeks ride that thing and then when your opportunities present themselves in play action and maybe on first down taking shots you hit them and that's what Noah Fafita is doing shout out to Mm -hmm. Noah Fafita you are starting to step up and really dominate then one last good here Cody I gotta Cody I gotta shout him out 
Louisville is back. They're looking better than ever. Jawar Jordan, it was questionable whether he was going to play in this game uh, with an injury. Did not look like he was injured at all. This dude was explosive, and I always love in his touchdown he had when the offensive line comes up from behind, one of the best plays in all football, pushes the pile, pushes Jawar <laughs> Jordan into the end zone. Love when the offensive line gets involved there. Um, no, and this team's got speed. And that was one thing that I was questionable of seeing was, how is Duke's defense against Louisville's speed? Could they slow them down? And this Louisville team is is fast on the perimeter. They got thrashed on the outside. Plummer didn't really make mistakes in this game, which is big. 117 yards passing, but they didn't do have to do a whole lot on the passing game when you got Jawar Jordan, 163 yards, two touchdowns. Um, and this defensive line from Louisville, too, was very impressive against a Duke offensive line. And we saw that against Notre Dame and how and how they stepped up against that Notre Dame offensive line. They made Riley Leonard look look very uncomfortable with already an uncomfortable sprained ankle, which sucks. I do want him to get healthy, but I think he's one of those guys that has to play for him throughout the season and kind of just, you know, hopefully the injury doesn't get worse when he prepares for the NFL draft. That's also what we talked about last week where we think that he, I think at least he's going to stay another year there at Duke just because he could be like the Drake May of Shador Sanders or Drake May of, of Caleb. He could be that for Shador Sanders. But four sacks for this defensive line, man. This Louisville team, everything's in front of him. They just got to win out, and they will play Florida State there. They win out as well in the ACC Championship. Yeah, you know, uh, you, your heart kind of goes out to Riley Leonard and to Duke because if it's like what could have been if Riley Leonard was able to stay healthy this year. Um, Very likable to team, too. Yeah, likable team. They play hard. Um, they do such a good job on the defensive side of the ball. I think they're just starting to run out of gas. Like that defense is starting to realize, like, damn, like, it's really up to us or else we can't mm. win any football games. And sometimes when you put that undue pressure on people that aren't used to it, um, it happens to be, unfortunately, um, this. Let's get to the bad. And the bad, the eh, like what we didn't like during the weekend. What is your first bad that stands out to you from what happened this weekend? We're going to stay in the ACC. Hey, Clemson, how are you feeling about the transfer portal? <laughs> Four losses. Bro, to, a, to a basketball school in NC State. Did you see that like, interview? Oh my gosh, he was pissed. Like, what are we like? Four and four for Clemson. That's like, I don't. I saw a thing that said Kate Klubnik is going to transfer at the end of the year. When at the beginning of the year, me myself included, said him and Garrett Riley. Oh man, it's going to be crazy. They're going to go crazy. They're going to put up 4,000 yards and 40 touchdowns, single-digit interceptions. Yeah. Um, we'll chalk that up as an L for Cody in his predictions for the year. Yeah, big L. Big L. Big you got him winning it all. Well, I, mean, I don't know which was worse. I had Texas Tech, but I no, mean no, no. Clemson. Oh, winning the ACC. I was like, wait a minute. Yeah. I didn't know. No, yeah, yeah. I'm saying which was worse, but yeah. Yeah. Um, Four and four. Oh, yeah. Good luck. You got at home against Notre Dame next week. Good luck. <laughs> Clemson, you might not make a bowl game this year. Sorry. That's so crazy to think about. Yeah. What? Okay, why? Why is Clemson not? Why is Clemson not Clemson this year? I'm so confused. Will Shipley's getting last rushes. Um, they got no weapons on the outside. They're, they're banged up on the defensive side of the ball. Kate Klubnick looks... Kate Klubnick looks like Zach Wilson in, in the uh, college football right now. I said it. I said I it. Love I it. said it. I but, love but, but, I mean, man, yeah. It, I wonder if Clemson's going to just gonna be like, hey, all right, we're going to be the number one transfer portal uh, college heading into next season, which they won't be number one. Colorado will be. But what's going on with what, – what, like, what – I mean, you said the transfer portal and stuff like that. But what is going on with Clemson? Two things. When you remove a Brent Venables who's been there through all their success, everyone knew, like, you go to Clemson to play defense and you go to Clemson to play in a high-powered offense. When you take away that linchpin, which is a Brent Venables who plays with fire and energy and all this stuff, it has a direct influence not only on your recruiting, but also the energy within your program for the players that have been there and known no different. That is a real thing. I don't care what anyone says. Coaches can affect players at that level in a myriad of ways. One being the energy that they play with and the passion that they play with. We're mm. still talking about 18 to 23 and 24 year olds. Easily distracted. Girls. 
alcohol, clubbing, parties, NIL deals. There's interviews. There's so many things that can happen in college. We both understand it and know it. We've been through it. Now, imagine being at a Clemson where you have access to all these other things that us lower level athletes didn't have access to. And you're supposed to go to school and you're supposed to get good grades and you're supposed to be at training table and you're supposed to be at practice and you're supposed to be watching film. Coaches can create or at least sometimes manufacture a level of passion and give a fuck that some coaches can't. And when you see guys that look like they're quitting and look like they're not giving the effort, I genuinely think that that directly stems from who your coordinator and assistant coaches are. And when you don't have a Brent Venables, who was that take charge, rah, rah, high energy guy that has those guys playing fast and playing with that love and that passion, it has the effect that you're seeing right now at Clemson. No, I think that's something too that Garrett Riley next year will probably more be, he needs to be that vocal guy, a little more of a quiet, you know, behind the scenes, doesn't really yell much on the sidelines. Um, he's up in the booth, I think, with with his with the phone on or whatever, talking to Cade Klumnik all the time. But I agree with you. I think they need that someone on that staff to step up. Dabo Sweeney is too. He can yell, but he's more of that players coach guy. They need that intense dude, like you mentioned with Brent Venables there. Um, Clemson bad. They might not make a bowl game, which is crazy to think about, like you mentioned there. Um, I think their over under total for wins was like eight and a half or nine and a half, which is crazy to think about where we are today. Four and four could be four and five next week. My bad. Um, and this one's kind of both teams. This game really wasn't really the, the best, but Colorado UCLA was just a bad game. I don't know if you watched yeah. that. You, you turn it on, you're like, oh my god, Chris Fowler and Kurt Herbstreit are, are announcing this game. Okay, usually yeah. usually those games turn out to be good outcomes or a, a neck and neck battle or. Maybe Colorado upsets UCLA when they're, when they're both announcing. But, I mean, just the first half. Uh, Doinks, a 24-yard field goal by UCLA. Lots of points left on the board. Only field goals from Colorado. Two fumbles from Carson Steele and an interception there for UCLA. They had four turnovers total. And Colorado, I mean, you had two interceptions from Travis Hunter. You've got everything in front of you. You can't, like we mentioned before, with Utah, when you're on the road against UCLA, a team that's got more athletes and just straight up bigger in the trenches, you've got to capitalize with touchdowns. And they did late, but seven sacks for UCLA. And Coach Prime even said after the game, he said, hey, we're, when we hit the portal, offensive line is going to be number one, which I agree. This offensive line looks way worse than this defense. The defense only allowed, which I say only allowed, 28 points, which at any other game we've seen from Colorado, if you only allow 28 points and your offense can score, usually you win those ball games. But, man, Colorado-UCLA, just – I mean, props to UCLA for winning, but just a bad football game. Your, your standouts, your takeaways from that one. You can't win when your quarterback is getting beat to shit the way Shador Sanders was getting beat up. You can't win when – there seems to be a lack of love of the game like it seems like Colorado's team has. You cannot win a football game when it seems like there are guys that are checked out and not caring about football, not caring about the university, not caring about social media or apparel sales or what celebrities are going to be on the sideline. Just the game. Like, there seems to be, like, a lack of energy on the sidelines. Like, to me, when you get an interception on defense, that whole sideline should be coming, running on the field, chest bumping, high-fiving, getting excited. Travis Hunter had to, like, on his own sideline, gets two picks and has to run to the sideline to get some love. That's wild to me. You mm. know me. A lot of people know me as, like, an energy, high-energy guy. Like I like I couldn't imagine watching one of my top players make one of those game changing type of plays and standing on the sideline with my arms crossed. I couldn't imagine doing that. And I'm watching it happen over and over and over again for this Colorado team. And it's almost like, well, yeah, he's supposed to do that. Cool. Like that doesn't mean that you don't get excited for it. Yeah. So it's just, it's weird. It's a weird dynamic right now going on in Colorado, and I hope Coach Prime, Prime can get it fixed. 
I love that take too, because especially in a road environment like that, when the sidelines got energy, when the road teams got energy, and you're the home team and the home crowd's quiet, that's scary. That is absolutely scary. And in the second interception, the first interception was great from Travis Hunter, but that second interception when he baited Garbers, thinking that he was going to go with the outside route, flips his hip quick, flips his hips quickly, turns around, attacks the football. Uh, uh, unreal. He's guarding two wide receivers within like five yards, five to ten yards of ground he made up there. Travis Hunter, I, every, day, every day I'm like, he's good at receiver. He's better at receiver than corner. This game, I'm like, like he's better at corner than receiver. <laughs> Next game, better better than receiver than corner. I don't know where this guy's going to play in the NFL in his future, but this dude's a ball hawk, and I love watching him play, Cody. Yeah, he's fun to watch. Um, shout out to UCLA's defense. You guys harassed and beat up Shador Sanders. Um, mm-hmm. Hey, Prime, I think you said it. Go get some all linemen, man, please, and thank you. And also, that Shiloh Sanders ejection was awful too. That's Horse also amazing. Shit. <laughs> Horse shit! I tweeted that. It is not targeting. He literally did everything you guys want him to do. He led with his shoulder, hit him in the chest. Like literally, what is he supposed to do on that? What? He didn't drive he... him to the ground either. He, he didn't just hit lift him, and... him up and drive him. He literally just hit him yeah. and left. I thought they were throwing the flag on him for taunting. And then when I heard targeting, get yeah. horse shit. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe the only other bad I would have is say Ohio State. Eh, all right. You beat Wisconsin 24 to 10. Braylon Allen didn't play. Ooh. Kyle McCord. Yeah. It was one of those. It wasn't, it wasn't bad. It wasn't good. It was just, eh, like, can we get better? I I worry. I know Mar- Marvin Harrison's the guy there. Right? I know Marvin Harrison Jr. is the guy. But when you got a team like Michigan down the stretch, they know how to cover Marvin Harrison Jr. They know how to cover Mar- – okay, will he have his own? Sure. But they know how to make – especially in that atmosphere in the big house, I think McCord's got to find – I think Emeka Mbuka's got to be healthy. I think Trevion Henderson healthy was big. 162 yards, one touchdown. That's what we've been saying for weeks now. They finally got the running game going with him. But – Cade Stover wasn't wasn't a factor in this game. If you've got to rely, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm sorry to offend these players. But if you have to rely on Julian Fleming and G. Scott to get you re- receptions, I think you lose. I think you lose, personally. I think those guys don't have a lot of experience in stepping up in big games like that. I would rather trust those other two guys. But I think Emeka Buka's got to be a guy that's healthy. But then on the other side of it, their defense has been looking good, Cody. But your thoughts on the Buckeyes. Um, it's always a tough game at Wisconsin, but. To win by 14, it's like, eh. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. With their head coach, Ryan Day, offensive guy. Big-time offensive guy. Brian Hartline, wide receivers coach, big offensive guy, co-offensive coordinator. It's interesting to now see the dynamic. Like, Ohio State has always had talented defenses, but right Mm. now this feels almost like the 2002 to 2006 Ohio State teams that were really fueled by their defense and the way that their defense was able to limit teams in what they like to do. So the talent on Ohio State's defense is starting to show, their talent and depth is starting to show in being able to stop the run and force teams into third and long and really be aggressive in not only their pressure packages, but being able to be intricate in their coverages um, and be able to lean on Latham Ransom and those other DBs in the secondary. So... Shout out to Ohio State. You guys are balling on the defensive side of the ball. Keep it up. If their offense can catch up, watch out. The ugly. Start us out, Cody. 49 points against Cal. 49 (laughs) points, USC's defense. They won the game, Cody. Alex Grinch isn't fired. In two weeks, when they get boat raced by Oregon and Eugene, Lincoln Riley, you might be on the hot seat. Yeah, you heard it here first. If Alex Grinch, because we said it, I think I said it or you said it, that Alex Grinch is the first coordinator to get fired this year. Get right, dude, because Cal should never drop half a hundred on that defense. There are too many good players on that defense. This is ridiculous. 49 points to Cal. That lets me know that Oregon is going to put up 70 against you guys. Good luck, Caleb. Good luck. <laughs> well, they got Washington first. So they got to play Washington. Oh, which, even better. Is even even worse. better. So they'll put up <laughs> 70 and then 80. My bad. Yeah. Yeah. The only worry for Washington would be it's at USC. But, again, we'll see. Right now they're only fair by Washington four points. Washington by two touchdowns. Spoiler alert. Sorry. <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, USC, when you almost lose to a quarterback named Fernando Mendoza. Mendo- Fran- Fernando Mendoza, true freshman quarterback, looked like Johnny Football out there. Um, yikes. But again, they won the football game, which all that matters, woohoo. But um, zero sacks, and what they said is one of the most the dominant defensive linemen, uh, front seven, the last two weeks have been non-existent. The USC team, which this will probably be the last time we talk about USC. We'll obviously talk about the USC Washington game, but I don't really want to talk about USC much. We already we already know what issues they have and what they've got to get done. But man, <laughs> fifty to forty nine to squeeze out that one. You do not feel good about that USC man. That would have been terrible, Caleb. Forty nine points. <laughs> the cow. <laughs> no disrespect to cow. Shout out to Marshall Sherrington. Uh, Director of recruiting there. Uh, shout out to uh, – he's a player per- personnel guy there at Cal. Gave us a great tour in the spring. Uh, shout out mm. to uh, EJ Kamagong, Garfield quarterback, class of 2024, headed there. Shout out to um, – ooh, there's a DB from Garfield that's going there as well. You know, Cal's doing a great job recruiting. Thank God because, man, God, 40, 49 points. <laughs> like <laughs> – I, like okay 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 let's move on let's move on let's move on the ugly. um next ugly um and we hate to say this because just a couple weeks ago we said this team was going to be a college football playoff contender and uh, somebody in here had him at, at the um winning the acc and in their playoff but north carolina loses to georgia tech 46 to 42 tez walker injured in this one 17 to 25, 310 yards, two touchdowns. You look at you look at the stats and you say, "Hey, Drake, man, you know, uh, you guys played well offensively. Why? How did you guys lose the game? You ran the ball 267 yards. You threw the ball for 310 yards. How'd you lose the game? Oh, that's right, Georgia Tech. Yeah, they scored 46 points and uh, they rushed for 348 yards. Yeah, that'll 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 do everything for you, man. <laughs> 348 yards to Georgia Tech, Cody." Um, hey North Carolina, remember a couple weeks ago when I said, "Oh, finally, like Drake May doesn't have to win every football game for North Carolina. Their defense is playing good." That wasn't a cue for you guys to shit the bed like you have the last two weeks. It literally has been like North Carolina heard us tell them that they were good on defense, and it was like, "Oh, bet are bad. Let's get back to what we were doing last year, yeah. giving up sixty whatever to App State." Like, oh my goodness. Like what a what a crazy two weeks after we put the midseason awards for Mr. Cody. <laughs> Literally. Like, what are we doing? Like you guys are making me look like an idiot. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, I think that's only the the last ugly I will we'll 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 stop talking about UNC and USC, the two the two teams that were great two weeks ago, the ugliest performances of week nine. Some quick hits real quick as we move on before we get to the top five quarterbacks for Cody. Some shout-outs. Northwestern's fourth win on the road at Maryland. I believe Actually, it might have been at home against Maryland, but they've won four games this season. They won 33-27. to 27. I'm shocked. We thought they were going to win one or two games with everything going on in the offseason. They go past the scandal, and they've won four games. Your thoughts, Cody? Two games away from bowl eligibility. If they get there... Watch out, coach of the year, coach of the year. I don't know. Definitely got to be up there, the interim head coach over there for Northwestern. I saw something too, Northwestern versus Iowa this weekend. It's the lowest recorded total in football history. The total is the over under. 29 and a half points is what they have for Iowa versus Northwestern. <laughs> so the final Crazy. score if you if you go with the over would be 16 to 14 or 15 to 15. Uh, it'd go Could to you overtime. imagine they just call it 15 <laughs> 15? We're not gonna we're not gonna finish the game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're just gonna call eyes, it here. My <laughs> eyes hurt. <laughs> my eyes hurt. Um some other ones. Kansas State beating Houston 41 to 0. They improved to 5 and 3, 5 and 2, 6 and 2. They look good. Um NC State, we talked about that over Clemson. But another one which peep into game balls here, but Nebraska's five and three. And you look at the Big Ten West right now. Let's talk Big Ten West. Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Nebraska all are tied. Cody, I look at this. Nebraska's got an offense. They've got a decent, mediocre defense for the Big Ten West. Can Nebraska sneak into the Big Ten championship? 
and be the representative of the Big Ten West in year one for Matt Rule, Cody? Nebraska? Uh-huh. Nebraska? Speaking of coach of the year, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, Matt Rule has done a really good job. You said their offense. He's he's a quarterback whisperer. Um, Matt Rule done a really, really good job. Shout out to him. Shout out to the Nebraska Cornhuskers being able to turn their season around. Um, it's fun to watch. Um, one of my quick hits, as always, we got the undefeated watch. Mid-major mm. undefeated watch. Liberty Flames undefeated. James Madison Dukes undefeated. And I keep picking against them, and they're probably like, keep picking against us, Cody. We love it. The Air Force Falcons. You're also 8-0. Shout out to the mid-major undefeateds, man. So cool to see a battle for who's going to be the New Year's Six representative from the from the group of five. And we can announce that we will preview the Mountain West Championship as well. Most programs only go Power 5, but we love the mid-majors here on this program. Fresno State just beat UNLV this last weekend. So that Fresno State Air Force game, depending on what Tulane does as well, that could decide who goes to the group of five there. Fresno State, Tulane, or Air Force, it's going to come out of the wire there, Cody. Yeah, and don't forget Liberty. If any of these teams slip up and Liberty's still undefeated and goes through the Conference USA and wins it, you never know. I wish James Madison was bowl eligible because they would be my favorite and they would be my pick to be the group of five. I'd love to see James Madison. Absolutely. (laughs) I think they're physically capable of doing it. I think that the NCAA needs to get rid of that rule. If we're in a division, if if we're D1, let us play. Let us play, (laughs) baby. Let the boys play. Let the kids play. My last two quick hits for you, Cody. West Virginia 5-3. and three. Big win on the road against UCF. That's been the shocker of the season for the Big 12. And then Miami's bowl eligible. 6-2. and two. Say what you want about Mario Cristobal and what he's done this season. But they're 6-2. and two. They make a bowl game. Step in the right direction for Miami. Absolutely. Shout out to Coach Cristobal. They got some good young talent on the edges on both sides of the ball. It's great to see the athletes coming back to, from Miami. Um, South Florida recruiting is starting to really pick up. Um, they're not losing guys up to Florida or to Georgia or over to LSU or to Bama anymore. They're really starting to put a mm. fence around that 305 area, which is good to see. Let's get into Cody's top five quarterbacks of week nine. Let's get right into it. Week nine, Cody's quarterbacks. And for those, we had a comment last week. It really irritated me, Cody, because people were saying, oh, why would you have um, this Utah Tech quarterback over Jaden Daniels, blah, 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 thinking people think that these rankings are just overall. And I that pissed me off. So I'm going to say this once again for people that do not know and that don't have a brain. These are based on performances of week nine. The after the season awards for overall quarterbacks will be after the season. We had a mid-season one with Cody as well. That was based on the now. But these performances are of week nine. Sorry, I got to rant for my guy, but Cody, honorable mention. So. You know how you guys are like, oh, why do you guys have these small quarterbacks? Newsflash, there's only one Power 5 quarterback in our whole list this week. So, oh. you can get mad at me all you want. Guess what? I probably would pick Jaden Daniels, Caleb Williams, Drake May, all these guys over these guys if I were choosing. However, this is based on, like Jackson said, week 9 performance. Honorable mention. <laughs> Preston Stone. From Southern Methodist University, that's SMU for you casuals, uh, 69 to 10 win over Tulsa, 15 of 20, 371 yards, three touchdowns, no picks. SMU is six and two, bowl eligible. Shout out to the Mustangs of SMU. Preston Stone, you are our honorable mention quarterback for week number nine. Number five. Number five, friend of the show. A regular on this list, Michael Penix Jr. from University of Washington. 42-33 to 33 win over Stanford. The interception that he threw was horse shit that was holding on the Stanford DB. Should have never happened. But 21-38, mm. 369 yards, four big touchdowns, one pick. UW rolls on. They play USC in a big primetime game this coming weekend. Michael Penix has officially stretched his lead um, in – the passing yards for NCAA Division One. He's up to almost 3,000 now. The next closest is Shador Sanders at like 2,600. Mm-hmm. Um, it looks like Michael Penix is going to defend his title 
as the passing yards leader from last year. Um, Michael Penix, you're our number five quarterback for week nine. Number four. Oh, look, another group of five quarterback, Joey Aguilar. Sorry, Joey Aguilar, App State quarterback, 48 to 38 win over Southern Mississippi, 23 of 33, 391 yards, four touchdowns, one pick, App State, big win over University of Southern Mississippi, 48 to 38, Joey Aguilar, you are number four quarterback for week number nine. Number three. Wow, another group of five quarterback outperforming these power five quarterbacks. Unreal. Gunnar Watson from Troy. Shout out to the fun belt. You guys are in here a lot. Um, Gunnar Watson from Troy. 31 to 13 win over Texas State. 26 to 40. 392 yards. Three touchdowns. Zero picks. Gunnar mm. Watson, you're a number three quarterback for week number nine. Number two. Number two. A Conference USA quarterback, another group of five quarterback, Frank Harris from University of Texas, San Antonio, 41 to 27 win over Eastern Carolina, 20 to 32, 395 yards, four touchdowns, only one interception. Frank Harris from UTSA, another big win in Conference USA. You are our number two quarterback for week number nine. And who's at number one? At number one, with 32 of 49, 411 yards, five touchdowns, zero picks, Chandler Rogers from University of North Texas. They actually lost to Memphis, and people are like, oh my gosh, you picked someone at number one who lost. I've done it in the past. I'm going to do it again in the future. <laughs> Chandler Rogers from University of North Texas. Like I said, 32 of 49, 411 yards, five touchdowns, zero picks. It's about performance, folks. He doesn't play defense. Chandler Rogers, you are our number one quarterback for week number nine. Love the list there. Do your research, folks, because we here at the point after, especially Cody Oaks, does the research too. Well done. Good list. Uh, let's get into buy or sell game balls. We'll put a wrap on week nine. For me, for my buy, I am buying that the Oregon Ducks will represent the Pac-12 and make the college football playoff. I think mm -hmm. you're the best team in college football right now in terms mm -hmm. of the Pac-12. I know you're a Washington guy, Cody, but we've got to be realistic when it's all said and done until we see a dominant performance. And at USC is one of those games for Penix that you can say whatever you want to say about the defense from USC. I want to see Washington back to what we saw Washington against Oregon. But for right now, this Oregon team may foot on the pedal foot on the pedestal, on the gas, and we are not looking back. They're focused, so focused on themselves. I love the effort. I love the energy, what Dan Lanning's doing, coaching the defensive side of the ball. Their offensive play calling is getting better. I like what Oregon is doing right now. I think Oregon wins the Pac-12. They represent the college football playoff. And, hey, this Oregon team's for real, folks. It's time to, it's time to put the attention on Oregon. Bye. Love it. That's a – I hate it. It's a good pick. I got to <laughs> buy. I'm going to buy that Bo Nix will be a Heisman Trophy finalist. I have mm. to. The way he's playing in these high-profile games that are supposed to be close, the reason they're not close is because of him. And the way he's able to affect every game, not only with his legs, but with his arm, his efficiency. He's not turning the ball over. He's throwing touchdowns. He's picking his spots. He's feeding his guys when they need to get fed. He's checking at the line of scrimmage. He's holding his guys to a standard, which is something mm. to be said. His guys are responding to him. Right now, like you said, Oregon looks like the class of not only the Pac-12, but in college football. Um, no disrespect to Michigan. I think you guys are really, really good, too. Um, but, yeah, I got to say I'm buying Bo Nix as a viable Heisman Trophy contender. And if Michael Penix Jr. keeps kind of – having these mid mid level games, don't be surprised if you see Bo Nix be able to sneak that away from him, especially with another head to head game looming with Washington on championship weekend, which could be the deciding factor in the Heisman Trophy race. Mmm. Bo Nix. Bodacious. I like that. I love that. Um my sell. And this one's tough for me. I got a lot of sells. I'm trying to narrow it down to just <laughs> Uno. I'm gonna sell and this is tough for me to say because I want this team to, you know, find a conference, but I'm selling Washington State hard. What is going on? You lose to Arizona State, 
when you've got more talent on the offensive side of the ball, your quarterback, you threw it 50 times. Can't get the running game going against a very depleted ASU football team. Come on. Dykarts, or whatever his name is, Den Kurtz over there for the coach at Wazoo. You said that you belong to be in a conference, and you guys have lost, what was it, four straight? They got to flip it around there if they even want to make a bowl game. I thought this Wazoo team was way better. I am selling Washington State. Get it together. You're on a losing streak right now. And um, I don't know who they play next, and I'm going to look at it while you say your yours, Cody. But this Washington State team, they need to get things rolling. They play at home against Stanford next week. Uh, Stanford, again, I don't know. They're, they're tough out. They're tough out right now, as we've seen the past couple weeks, against Colorado and then Washington. But I am selling Wazoo. Great sell. I have to sell. And I know that this is going to, like, hurt, but I have to sell oh, Oklahoma okay. winning the Big 12 championship. I have to. I think they Indiana. had to. Like, that Kansas game, they kind of – it's one of those, like, confidence booster games if you win it, and then one of those, like, confidence killers or just, like, gut punches when you lose it, especially the way they did. Um, mm. I think – I like. I really hope it doesn't turn into too long, especially with Bedlam this weekend, um, and the way that Oklahoma State is able to run the football. I'm nervous, man. I'm nervous. I really like. There couldn't be a worse opponent to play right now than Oklahoma State <laughs> after what Kansas just did. So on the road, um, oh yeah, on the road. in Stillwater, um, I got to sell Oklahoma as the Big Twelve champ. Dude, my heart hurts for you, bro. Hearing you say that, it, it, a couple weeks ago when I came on this program and I said Notre Dame, I saw Notre Dame as a CFP contender. It, it hurts, doesn't it hurt? But it now does. you can now you can now you can look past our our Homer teams. You know we're yeah. not very Homer much <laughs> on this program, but now you can look past it. I mean, I Notre Dame. Shout out Notre Dame. They beat Pittsburgh pretty bad this last oh, weekend. My They'll goodness. make a New Year's Six game, but yeah, dude, that that would hurt my heart there, Cody. Oh, yeah, that one. it was. It's hard to admit, but it is what it is. We're growing. We're growing. Oh man! Hey, we'll see what happens. On I do want to see a rematch though with Oklahoma Texas. That'd be fun to watch. But mm. I don't know the way Texas is playing right now and the debacle, the chaos in the Big Twelve. We will talk about that in just a bit. Game ball. We'll wrap this one up. I've got one game ball, and this is a big pivotal moment on the road rivalry game. My game ball goes out to Carson Beck. This dude balling. This dude, I'm still gonna say it. I'm still gonna say this guy deserves to be a Heisman finalist because I think he does. 19 to 28, 315 yards passing, two touchdowns. I love what I'm seeing from Carson Beck and this Kirby Smart led Georgia team. Making me look good. Keep them in the playoff. Let's run the table, Georgia. Uh, and then beat LSU or Alabama or Ole Miss, whoever represents on the other side. But Carson Beck, shout out to you. Keep balling. Biggest forehead in college football, might I add. Biggest absolutely, forehead in college football. Absolutely. That's probably, why he's, that's probably why he's balling. Big brain, big forehead, Carson Beck. Absolutely. I have two game balls. I'm going to give them out quickly. Jordan Newbin from Minnesota running back. 40 carries. Guys, 40 carries. 204 mm-hmm. yards, two touchdowns. Big win over Michigan State. Keep Minnesota in the hunt for that Big Ten West Championship. And Ollie Gordon from Oklahoma State. 25 carries, 271 yards, two touchdowns, and their big win for Oklahoma State over Cincinnati. Last two games, Ollie Gordon, listen to these numbers. In two games, Mm. 54 carries for 553 yards and six touchdowns. Ollie Gordon, you are on a ridiculous tear right now. Please don't do that to my Oklahoma Sooners this weekend. Now, if he does do this against a Brent Venables defense from Oklahoma, do we start to get on the Heisman hype train for Ollie Gordon? I don't know. The guys, he's gone over 250 yards two weeks in a row. So don't be surprised. And with that, we put a bow. We put a wrap on the week nine. But we're not done with this episode yet, Cody. The college football playoff rankings come out on Tuesday. And we're going to talk a little bit of what we think the CFP is going to be like. What are our top six as of right now? And maybe some sneaker teams, sneaky teams. now. When the playoffs have been around, no team outside of the initial top 10 has made the CFP. So that's something to keep out there, which I didn't know that until I heard that the other day, and I was shocked. I was like, wow, okay. Only So there's, this is going to narrow down the top 10 teams in college football right now um, when it's all said and done. But, Cody, I think for my, for me, if you don't mind me starting, if you don't mind me starting. 
Feel free. I think this is, I think this is how it's going to be. I don't agree with this, but I think this is how the rankings is going to be. One Georgia. Top six. I think it's tough. I think it's tough for them to get rid of Georgia at one of what they've done in the past week schedule. You could say that, but Carson Beck's balling out. I think they're comfortable there with the committee on Georgia too. I think based on the resume, they've got the strongest resume right now. I think Ohio State's too. Absolutely. I think Ohio State's too. Maybe we can kind of collab on this together. I think we might have the same, but you what you you would say one and two. Georgia and then Ohio State, even though we think Michigan's better, but sure. what the committee's going to do. What I think the committee's going to do is because based on resumes and teams being undefeated, this is what I think they're going to do. I think they're going to go Ohio State one. I think they're going to go Florida State Ooh. number two. Really? You think, that, you think Florida State two? The LSU win, big. That's big. The Duke win, big. Um who else did they beat? They beat Clemson early. Early, when Clemson was, yeah. Was considered better. Um, I think just the resume of that. L- I think the fact that LSU keeps winning is really big for Florida State. So I think Ohio State's going to go one. Their resume, like you said, is just better than everyone's. Penn State, uh, Notre Dame. Um, who else did they beat? Uh, I mean, they had Wisconsin, Wisconsin, Ohio State. But those three, um, those three, those three are, are are good wins. So I think that you got to give them give them the nod there. So, like I said, I think it's going to go Ohio State. I think it's going to go Florida State. I think you then go Georgia, um, and then I think Michigan. But I think, again, it's just based on, like, we talked about at the beginning of the year. Georgia and Michigan's schedules are ass. Like, it just is what it is. So, when it's the initial rankings, I think the initial rankings don't really mean a whole lot other than being in the top ten. I think those top four, that's how it's going to shake out. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think on the outside looking in, you got five probably um, Oregon and six Washington or flip those Ooh, maybe like yeah, put I, Washington five Oregon six I was gonna so for me I was gonna say um Georgia one Ohio State two I think Michigan three Florida State four and then I was gonna put Washington five just because the head-to-head I think they're over Oregon even right, though right, right now right. recency bias um they would you know Oregon looks better than Washington I think Washington Oregon there and then shoot I hate to copy the AP poll right now but seven Texas eight Bama looks fine yeah. Um, maybe, you know, they they got Oklahoma at 10 and they've got Penn State at nine. A team that's interesting to me that I can maybe see squeaking to the top 10 would be either Ole Miss. They've been balling. They're seven and one. Or I don't know what your thoughts on this based on maybe, you know, the Bama game coming up. But what do you think about LSU? I, don't, I think they maybe squeak to 11, but two losses kind of sucks for them. But based on yeah. what we've seen recently, that they look like Miss a top loss. 10 team. That yeah. Ole Miss loss. I just don't see it. Jaden Daniels is still up for the people who have him in their highs and rankings too, which is quite absolutely insane. Yeah, absolutely. I, well, he's he's doing what I said he was going to do at the beginning of the year: the three hundred, one hundred every single game. Like he's going to threaten that three thousand, one thousand threshold, man. And there might be eleven and two, especially if they win the SEC championship. Don't be surprised. A long, great banger episode twenty-two here at the point after. Um, we appreciate all the love and support. Monday, Thursday episodes every single week, twice a week. We're we're running strong. I believe we're like three or four weeks straight with two episodes a week, which W consistency by both of us. But last thoughts here as we wrap up week nine. And well, week 10 looks like to be a really exciting week. Can't wait. LSU, Bama, USC, Washington. Can't wait for another banger of a weekend of college football, the game we love so much. Absolute pleasure working with you, my boy. Hey, you too, my guy. Bedlam will be played. Georgia, Missouri will be previewing Ole Miss, Texas A&M. We got a lot of great games, a lot of stuff. to Even we'll preview Oregon State at Colorado just because people love talking about the Buffaloes going on over there. But for Cody Oaks, I'm Jackson Groff. This is The Point After, episode 22. We'll see you on Thursday for another banger episode here at The Point After. Peace!